Okay, well, we'll get started. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tan Dang, and I'm the Assistant Director of Community Development with the City of Harrisonburg. This meeting tonight is the first of three open houses for the Zoning and Subdivision Ordinances Update Project. This project is very significant and one that will have a long lasting impact on our city as the zoning and subdivision ordinances affect how communities physically develop, look, and function. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to share with you module one of the draft ordinances, highlighting some of the significant changes and questions that we have for the community, and also to allow folks to provide comments and to ask us questions of ask questions of the consultant team and city staff. Before we begin this presentation, I would like to recognize and thank a, a number of people, including Adam Fletcher, Director of Community Development, and Wesley Russ, Assistant City Attorney, for serving with me on the core project team, along with our consultants, Kendi Keys Collaborative, as leaders of this project. I'd also like to thank city staff, um, who are too many to name, but represent different departments throughout the city, for assisting in the review of, of module one and who have engaged in countless hours of dialogue and challenging and supporting each other as we've worked on this. And finally, I'd like to recognize and thank the Ordinance Advisory Committee who include council members Laura Dent and Sal Romero and 12 community members who were appointed by city council to serve uh, on the Ordinance Advisory Committee as a sounding board for new ideas and solutions and to provide constructive input on the ordinances. And with that, I would like to turn this over to Brian Mabry. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ton. I'm Brian Mabry with Kendall Keys Collaborative. And with me is Ashley Woolsey. She's on our team and uh, we'll be helping out. There's Ashley with uh, this, uh, this meeting. Thank you very much for being here. We have really good attendance, believe it or not. I see 38. Uh, in all, and uh, 33 attendees. That's almost, last I checked, 100% almost of the people who registered. So that's uh, very good, uh, very good uh, indeed. So just diving in, because we have a lot to cover. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, some background during this presentation, how we got to where we are uh, in this project. Talk about module one content. This project, again, is divided up into three modules, with this first module being about zoning and land use, um, along with uh, how uh, different things are measured, like height and setback and uh, things of that nature. I'm going to give you a quick little tutorial on how to use the software that hosts this draft code, and then we'll end with questions and comments and uh, uh, answers as well, hopefully. Um, as we go through this uh, exercise tonight, there'll be a few polling questions that you'll see that you'll be able to answer in real time. And there uh, will be some things for you to think about that will show up on the screen. Um, that's for you to make mental notes of or physical notes of uh, and think about, uh, and then maybe bring to um, discussion toward the end. So um, if you have a question that arises as I'm presenting, there is should be a, a Q&A button um, on your Zoom interface. You might have to tap, tap the um, more button uh, with the three dots and uh, uh, type your question there and then we'll get to it when we are doing the Q&A at the end. Um, there should also be a raise hand button uh, that is available either on your status bar uh, type uh, interface or under the three dots that say more, the ability to uh, raise hands. Um, and if you would do that um, when we're doing the actual Q&A at the end, that would be great. So basically, um, uh, enter your questions at any time. And then when we're doing the comments, if you just have something you want to say, you can raise your hand and we'll um, unmute you and you can turn your camera on if you want to. Um, and we'll um, try to address your question at that point. So um, that's sort of the, uh, the lay of the land here as we uh, get started. 
talking about the difference between a comprehensive plan and a zoning ordinance is really uh, kind of a foundational thing for, for what we're doing here. Uh, Harrisonburg has a rather new comprehensive plan um, from a couple of years ago that was adopted. And the zoning ordinance is a, one of the main ways to um, make a reality a lot of the recommendations that are in the comprehensive plan. So think of it, uh, think of the comprehensive plan as kind of a menu with um, different options that are available at the restaurant and pictures of what you could have, uh, things of that nature, while the, <coughs> excuse me, the zoning ordinance is more of the cookbook that the restaurant has that shows how things are, are made on the menu. Not quite as many pictures as a comprehensive plan has, um, but the instructions are all there, very detailed oriented. While the comprehensive plan is a set of, um, again, recommendations that are by nature broad uh, and could be um, implemented or made into reality a number of different ways. Zoning ordinance is a set of laws. Comprehensive plans are recommendations. And we'll also be dealing later on in this project with the subdivision ordinance um, and some other things like that. But basically, uh, it's all ordinances versus plans, if you want to compare them that way. So let's think about a few things that zoning ordinances and subdivision ordinances can address. There are the things that you're going to see in the table of contents for these documents when, we're, when you're actually reviewing them and when we're talking about them in this. Uh, this open house and in future open houses. So zoning and subdivision ordinances address land use on private property. So where the bookstores are, where the coffee shops are, where apartments are, um, and that sort of thing. And they're tied to a zoning uh, map that um, lays out the city and assigns zoning districts to um, every part of the city. We're mainly dealing with the text, especially today in this um, open house meeting, dealing with the text of the zoning ordinance, the written rules as opposed to the map. So land uses taking place on private property, um, how tall a building can be, um, some parameters on how it can be designed, how uh, where it is placed on the property, how close to the front property line or how back it can be. Um, it deals with parking, how much parking or how little parking can be provided and what the design of that parking can look like. Landscaping, for example, along a street or between two different land uses. Um, signs is another big um, piece of zoning regulations. Uh, sign regulations have to do with how big of a sign, where it can be placed on the property, what types of signs a business or a house can have. There's lighting, there's floodplain regulations, there are, when you're getting more into the subdivision ordinance side of things, um, street widths and street layouts, where sidewalks can go. And then getting more into the administrative aspect, there are um, procedures set out in zoning ordinances and subdivision ordinances that describe how a person would go about obtaining a rezoning or obtaining a variance or a special exception and other procedures like that. Nonconformities describe how uh, things, whether buildings or land uses or signs or other items like that, how they are treated if they were established before the rules changed and now they no longer comply with the rules. The city can't say you have to remove that thing because it no longer meets our regulations. Um, the city generally has to let those things continue to exist and be maintained, but there are just some parameters for how they can be treated. And then enforcement, uh, how uh, what the penalties are for breaking the, the law of the ordinance, how um, warnings are given out, and things of that nature. Then on the flip side of the coin, there are topics that these documents cannot address, or at least not directly address. So this isn't setting a property tax rate or assessing property values. It doesn't have to do with annexation plans, uh, and, and your city is mostly landlocked, so that would be irrelevant anyway. Um, pardon me, it doesn't have to do with the structural safety of a building. Um, that's more about the building code and, um, you know, the fire code. Uh, it can have an impact in that we can require that 
um, heating, ventilating, ventilation, and air conditioning units are screened, like on the top of a roof, um, and can require certain things on the outside of buildings, but um, it's not about really the structural safety of a building. It doesn't have to do with public works projects. This doesn't dictate, it's not like a capital improvements plan where there are um, plans and budgets laid out for extending streets or extending utilities or widening streets or adding capacity to utilities like water lines and wastewater lines. It doesn't have to do with sidewalk repairs or street repairs. If there were potholes that, you, uh, that annoy you on your way to work every day, um, unfortunately, we wouldn't be able to address those here. And it doesn't really directly relate to dilapidated structures. Um, we can have provisions in a zoning ordinance that encourage the revitalization of property, but it doesn't have um, this document or these documents won't have anything to do with requiring people to maintain their property. So as I mentioned, there are going to be some polling questions that are going to take place throughout the this, this exercise tonight. And this first one is just a test question to make sure, <coughs> excuse me, things are working right. And so I am going to launch our first little test poll, which is, um, were you involved in the comprehensive plan update that took place in 2018? And the choices are yes, no, or don't know, or don't remember. So I'm gonna launch that poll, let it be up for about uh, 30 seconds and give everybody a chance to answer. And it looks like everybody's got a got the hang of it because we're already at 80 percent. So and we've kind of come to a stop on the answer. So I'm going to end the polling now. And you should be able to see the results, which were that um, most of you, a little more than half of you, 53 percent, were not involved in the comprehensive plan update, and a few of you, a little over a third, were, and some don't remember or don't know. So that is um, how the polling works. Um, so oh, actually, I don't know if that was showing up. Now it should be, sorry. Um, I had to do one little click there where it wasn't showing up. Um, so that's the results. And I'll try to remember to share them each time for each polling question that we have. So I'm going to stop sharing those um, results and keep going. Here's the process for this project, some key milestones. We are currently in phase two, which we call iterative drafting. We already in phase one had um, some activities where we uh, interviewed stakeholders, a bunch of different kinds of people who interact with your current regulations, um, did some field reconnaissance of actually being in the city um, been a little cramped with um, lockdown, uh, especially at the time when when we were doing these activities so that um, we weren't able to be in person as much as we would have liked to have been. Um, we've looked at your existing regulations, your existing comprehensive plan, and had several other um, activities related to that. Now in the drafting phase, it's iterative because there's several iterations. We provide a draft to staff. They very thoroughly look through that draft and provide comments to us, the consultants. And then we um, look at the edits or look at their comments and um, uh, work them into the draft. And then eventually it gets published like it has been on the um, project website so that you all can look at it as well. Um, in addition, each module gets presented to a staff steering committee and an ordinance advisory committee um, who kind of review it looking out for their own best interests, but also for the interests of the community at large. Eventually, as we get into fall, we will move into the public review and comment phase where we will have an entire public review draft posted online with the three modules glued together so that they can be um, looked at on the project website and commented upon by anyone who, who wishes to do that. And then finally, the fourth phase is adoption that would be um, uh, lasting from approximately late this year to early next year. Um, like any ordinance, this, um, these documents will go to the Planning Commission for a formal hearing and recommendation and then go to the City Council as well 
for a hearing will the, where the city council will make the final decision on adopting uh, the ordinances and determining the exact contents that are in them. Something to remember is that anything you're looking at in this project is a draft and will remain a draft until it's adopted. So um, don't think that just because something is written in the draft that it is um, permanent and can't be changed, it very easily certainly can be changed. Um, we're open to um, any comments that would make this um, these documents uh, the best they can be for your city. <clears throat> I've mentioned some modules uh, that are on the um, that are part of this project. Three modules. And I've got the content here um, on the screen uh, for each of the three modules. So this first one is going to have to do, as I've kind of said, probably with zoning district, land uses, and the dimensional standards. So setback height. Um, and, and things of that nature. We also will have definitions in each of the three modules because often people um, uh, rightly believe that maybe they can't give a thorough review of the modules if they um, can't understand what some of the words are. And planners definitely like to use some terms of art sometimes where um, they definitely need definitions. <clears throat> modules two and three are shown on the screen, their contents basically. Module two is mostly related to design standards, and then module three is mostly related to um, procedural um, aspects that I mentioned before. There are some key big picture enhancements um, that we are looking at in the zoning ordinance and that you'll see when you review it. Um, the first is implementing the comprehensive plan <clears throat> and some of the policies that are uh, in it. So there are items uh, that are related to um, our recommendations in the comprehensive plan related to the missing middle, which is um, sort of a newer concept in zoning where um, many cities have um, plenty of single family detached, just your typical dwellings, and they have plenty of apartments, but there often is not a lot in between where there aren't a lot of um, duplexes or triplexes or quadruplexes. So um, those um, aspects are addressed in the draft and given standards to abide by. There's also an updating of the land use table. A lot of work has gone into this um, by the staff. This is a table we'll, we'll see in a moment that shows different kinds of land uses uh, that are permitted in the different um, zoning districts. We've also shown uh, in our um, document increasing of uh, the density in the development standards. Density is the number of dwelling units per acre is how it is um, almost always measured. The number of either houses, the number of uh, units, if you think of it in terms of a duplex or apartment, that are allowed um, per acre. Some refining of our home occupation standards are in this draft, and those are related to think of um, uh, home-based um, kitchens that sell um, items, uh, food items um, from their home that are to retail consumers. We have clarified um, uh, and we think improved upon the solar um, energy requirements and standards that are in your current um, regulations, um, working with manufactured homes on how they are defined and how they're allowed to be placed on a property um, is a, uh, another big thing, uh, including regulations related to beekeeping. That's becoming also more popular um, uh, uh, for the past few years where people want to be able to raise their own um, honey and um, have a, a food, um, sustainable food source like that to either use themselves or sell. And um, so we're addressing that in the this document as well. So um, as we keep going through, are there other more big picture items that you can think of that would be um, good for this uh, process to address? And maybe we are addressing them. There's only so much we can fit on this um, slide or other slides. So um, think about that. What are some other topics that are kind of bigger picture ones that, that we could look at in this process? <clears throat> I 
So getting into the um, even more of the content of the document, uh, this is this zoning ordinance is divided into articles, um, and the first article that we're looking at uh, is Article A, uh, general provisions. It's definitely kind of the driest and the most legalistic of the uh, three articles that make up Module 1. Article A lays out the purposes of the zoning ordinance. What are the different things that the zoning ordinance promotes? And that can be important because certain um, development proposals might be measured up against, to, against the purpose of the zoning ordinance. So you want to have a good foundation built in that um, that uh, shows what the zoning ordinance wants to encourage. So um, economic development, you know, making it easier or as easy as we can to um, have a, to start a business, even if it's from your home, doing infill and redevelopment, making more efficient use of land that's already been developed around it, but maybe there's vacant properties that could be, could use some um, filling in promoting affordable housing by having more housing types available that are can be built um, a little more densely than what's currently allowed. Multimodal transportation, encouraging walkability. There's several things that these two documents can do to, um, to encourage walkability, which relates to the placement of the building, um, width of sidewalks, and some other aspects like that. Jurisdiction, just stating that the um, ordinance applies within the city limits. Vested rights have to do with when someone has, especially a maybe a, a, a developer or just a property owner, really um, small scale, um, has submitted uh, a request prior to adoption. How much can they um, be, um, what we say, vested under the old rules? Um, there may, might have been some expectation on their part that they would be under um, older rules based on previous approvals, maybe on that same property. So just spelling that out. Um, in the at the front uh, is what we would do. And then the effective date, when does this become, when do the rules in this document or these documents become effective? Um, and adoption is going to be um, early 2022. And so, um, you know, that's going to be at some point, some specific date will be the effective date in these um, new documents that when those uh, regulations in them will become um, effective. Getting into uh, even more content, Article B, the district development standards. Um, there are, um, this is where the kind of the rules for where, th where buildings sit and how tall they can be and how much density you can have in a zoning district um, get laid out. Um, there are also some rules about how to interpret the zoning map. That's the other half of the zoning ordinance that maps out where the different zoning districts are in the city. Um, something to remember, zoning establishes where land uses are allowed or not allowed, and it establishes how much, um, uh, what, what kinds of, for example, landscaping or what kinds of parking potentially um, uh, apply to a piece of property. So it's very important um, in terms of, uh, of grouping um, properties in the city under different little umbrellas of zoning districts. And they're a very important way uh, again, of implementing the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan lays out different um, land use categories and recommendations. And then the zoning ordinance really um, ideally is going to piggyback off that and um, put those recommendations into legal effect. We will be in this document merging uh, a lot of the existing zoning districts into um, fewer a fewer number of zoning districts uh, and repurposing many of them as well. Merging districts like that is helpful many times in that it makes the district more um, well. It makes it easier to administer for staff. Fewer districts um, that can handle more different kinds of development scenarios are generally easier for staff to administer and interpret and enforce, often easier for property owners to understand really what district they're in as opposed to a lot of different overlay districts that some places might have that would apply to property. We might have overlay districts in the second module, but definitely not um, uh, just a real plethora of them I would, I would, I would anticipate. Um, <clears throat> having consolidated zoning districts also uh, helps 
with um, allowing a, a property owner to do something on their property without necessarily needing to request a change in zoning. We often hear rightly, correctly, that um, time is money for anyone, even a, just a, a, a single lot property owner needing to do a once in a lifetime rezoning. Um, time can really equate to money. And so um, a lot of cities want to streamline their regulations. And the ultimate streamlining would be if no rezoning is required in the first place, um, instead of uh, having to pursue the uncertainty and expense of a zoning ordinance, the property owner can get right to work and build something or add on to their house or whatever the um, situation might be. So the zoning districts are broken down into residential, mixed use, non-residential and overlay. And as I said, there will be um, a few overlay districts, I, I believe in, in module two. Um, they're really simple and it's very, um, uh, I think admirable of staff to um, be open to uh, such a such a efficient set of zoning districts. Many times in a city, uh, you know, a city the size of Harrisonburg might have 30 zoning districts when we start off <clears throat> on a project. And that is, um, can be very confusing. And a lot of times these um, districts were created just to solve one little problem on one little property and only used once. Um, these uh, this efficient set of really one, two, three, four, five, six, seven um, base districts there are um, going to allow a great number of uses and also have, though have protections built in to surrounding property owners so that it's not just anything goes, but um, there is some, some uh, protection built in. There's a table in the uh, draft zoning uh, document that has each of the zoning district listed out on the left and then in the middle it describes the purpose of that zoning district and then on the right which probably won't go into the final version um, but it's just that sort of as an aid um, there are the current or the old depending on how you want to look at it zoning districts that make up the new district um, but again we have um, seven base districts that we're going to go into a little more detail about each of those in the upcoming slides so we won't be showing a uh, proposed zoning district map just yet in this um, open house. Um, that will eventually be part of this project and you'll be able to review it um, online and in an exercise similar to this one. Um, but right now we're just showing uh, the, the, zoning, the proposed zoning district on the left and some locations where they could um, potentially go in the future either as part of this project or through um, a zoning request, rezoning request by the property owner in the future. So um, uh, an ex example would be the AUC auto urban commercial. Um, generally think of that as the current B2 district um, or areas in the comp plan on the land use guide, which you see on the right, that shows that recommends commercial or limited commercial uses um, there. So we're sharing this to help everyone understand where um, where the zoning districts uh, might be um, applied uh, physically in the city, so that you all can um, probably you know better anticipate the impact um, uh, of these uh, this action and be able to provide comments in the future when we when we're taking comments on the map. Um, we can also the city could look at um, taking your comments on the map when it's released as a way to update the uh, land use guide and the comprehensive plan. That wouldn't be part of this project, but it's definitely something that could soon um, follow up after adoption of the zoning ordinance and the subdivision ordinance. So some properties might be rezoned um, <clears throat> through this process to a district that most closely matches the current use on the property. And some properties in the city might be rezoned to a district that closely aligns with what's recommended on the land use guide that you're seeing on the slide. Um, so one reason that might uh, happen that way um, would be that um, if you had, uh, in order to not basically initiate a rezoning to a higher intensity use as part of this project, um, uh, for example, 
if there were a, res a residential district and the, the land use plan recommended mixed use or something more um, intense, uh, probably wouldn't just automatically rezone that property as part of this process to that more intense district just because out of concern of the um, neighboring properties and the area itself and making sure that the infrastructure in the area, the streets and the utilities and everything could handle that kind of, uh, of density. So that would probably end up being more of a situation where the property owner um, themselves uh, requests the rezoning uh, after the new regulations are adopted, as opposed to them, again, just being kind of rezoned as part of the adoption of these documents and as part of the adoption of the zoning map. So now we're going to start looking at each of the zoning districts. These tables and these illustrations are in the document for each of the districts. And I'm going to um, just quickly go through these uh, so that we have time for questions and answers. Uh, the LR, Low Density Residential District, allows a wide variety, uh, well, a pretty wide variety of housing types. We get even wider as we get to the other districts. but allows for single family detached, which is what most people are familiar with. Single family attached, where there are two different um, dwelling units that are, that are within one structure, but that are on two separate lots. So think of it like a duplex, but a lot line drawn between that can be separately owned. Whereas the duplex is all under one ownership, but it is two units on a single um, property. So building in all the ability to do all three of those um, with <clears throat> a density of somewhere between seven to eight dwelling units per acre. The medium density residential has the same uses uh, that I just spoke of for low density residential, that being single family detached, single family attached and duplex. But we also add triplex or quadruplex and townhouses. Um, you're probably familiar with triplexes and quadruplexes where there are three different units in one building with three different sets of, uh, of occupants. Townhouses are kind of like what I described for single family attached, except that it's more than two units, it's three, uh, maybe on up to eight. We have a question about that later to gauge your, um, what you think of that. But um, having townhouses and um, tri uh, and quadruplexes uh, goes back to addressing that missing middle um, concept that we mentioned earlier. All allowed in one district um, so that someone could do um, several of these different housing types in a development and not have to um, carve out little zoning district niches within on that property. They can all do it in one district. The density in this uh, zoning district is between 12 to 21 um, dwelling units per acre. And it also allows, um, and so does low density residential, allows several different <clears throat> non-residential uses um, that you would expect kind of in, in a residential neighborhood. Not quite mixed use, but definitely allowing um, some non-residential uses. Then high density residential um, adds apartments to the mix so that the density is between 15 and 24 dwelling units per acre. There's also even more non-residential uses permitted. Um, and uh, again, the table shows the different setbacks the different building heights, lot sizes, and lot widths that are available in this district, depending on the kind of uh, dwelling unit that someone wants to wants to do. <clears throat> we are uh, proposing to make many of the zoning districts um, significantly more dense, have the ability to do denser development to the extent that um, many of the existing lots in the city would be able to be subdivided and have um, on the new lot that's created when the, when the existing lot is subdivided, have another uh, dwelling basically built on them. Um, what you see on the slide gives sort of a conceptual view of that where, um, where you couldn't have done many of these arrangements before. There would be, have the ability to have um, going from left to right, um, a side-by-side -side duplex, um, looking at um, B and C, uh, a, a separate single family detached uh, develop, or, uh, building 
with an access easement because you're going to have to that driveway is going to have to cross over onto the other property in, in all likelihood um having on the uh, letter d there a separate um, dwelling unit that access uh, accesses the alley to the rear um and you can even think of letter e there being sort of an over under duplex even though it's the basement where there would be um, two separate dwelling units one on top of the other as opposed to over in letter a where they are next to each other so this adds um, definitely adds density to um, a lot of the parts of the city and it has the, the benefit though of um, we think of promoting um, uh, housing ownership and affordability um, so that you know a property owner could subdivide cut their property in half a lot or rely on either an access easement at the front or alley access in the back and be able to either sell that property and uh, someone else build a new house on it or build the house themselves, sell it off, um, build the house themselves and rent it if they wanted to, um, leaves a lot of options open for um, property owners to, to, to do things uh, like that. So here's the next polling question um, that I'm gonna put on the screen. And that is, um, what are your thoughts on what we just talked about on allowing a wide variety of housing types, single family, duplex, townhouses, trying quadruplexes, and most of the residential districts. And your choices are range from strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, strong, strongly agree, or don't know, or don't understand. Um, I'm going to launch this poll here. And feel free to go ahead and answer. And I'm seeing a message that uh, the polling results um, are staying on people's screens. Um, if that's happening to you, and I know the poll is still open, I'll close it in a second. I'll, I'll try to make sure that those aren't showing, but I think if you, you might be able to exit out of that, hopefully that's not blocking your view of um, what's showing on the screen. Um, I'm going to end the poll now, and I'm going to share the result. So um, a little over half of, of those of us who are here uh, taking part in this uh, strongly agree with this concept of allowing um, more, basically more housing types in the zoning district and more density, <clears throat> density um, getting uh, almost over 80%. To either agree or strongly uh, agree um, about 14 or so percent um, either strongly disagree or or disagree with this concept and um, so I get I think something to think about is um, what can we try to do to ease those, con those concerns um, and uh, we'll do what we can to, to try to, to um, help out with that if there are concerns related to this concept I'm going to try to close and stop sharing the results and close out of the poll and um, hopefully that works or you can exit out of the poll results yourself if that is a possibility. <clears throat> Just one explanation when you're looking at some of the dimensional standards, especially for the downtown um, areas and the mixed use areas. Um, there's a thing called frontage build out where this goes along where there is a minimum setback and a maximum setback. So most people or many people understand what a minimum setback is. That is the minimum amount that the building has to be away from the street. In a typical really suburban setting, that's 25 feet. Um, in some settings that may be more like 10 feet. Um, but there's also a concept of a maximum setback and that's how close you the building needs to be to the street. And that's usually expressed as a range. So the, the uh, in many cases, in more of a downtown setting, the maximum uh, uh, setback is 10 feet and the minimum is zero. So it could be right at the property line. And so there's a, um, 
uh, kind of a window there that you can see in the on the image on the right. That blue area is the range between the minimum setback and the maximum setback. And that's one of the tools to try to make the area more walkable is by forcing buildings closer to the street, just because people um, feel more comfortable walking, generally speaking, walking somewhere if they um, have a little bit of enclosure on, on both sides of them, as opposed to a vast expanse of parking lot or, or something like that. And so <clears throat> the frontage build out is the percentage of the building that has to be within that um, envelope, that blue area that, that it needs to sit in. So if you said 100%, then that would mean that the, the entire building frontage has to be within that blue area. Um, if you said something like you see on the image on the right, that's probably more like 50% um, uh, or 60% roughly, because there's a piece of that building to the left that is within the blue area, and then there's a bump out um, or a bump in, I guess you could say, uh, that's indented in the building where there's um, some kind of feet landscaping feature or, or open space feature. So that's probably about a 60% build out. So there are different measurements you're going to see when you're looking at the draft. It'll say frontage build out. Um, basically, the closer that percentage is to 100, the more of a solid wall there would be along the street. While if it was 10%, there'd be only one little bitty piece of the building that would be um, in that blue area and the rest could be set back however far back. So just to explain that um, as you're looking um, at the draft. <clears throat> there are a couple mixed use districts. The mixed use neighborhood is, um, well, sort of, it's not the downtown. The other mixed use neighborhood is the MUC mixed use center. The mixed use neighborhood is recommended in the comprehensive plan and it has um, uh, areas in the comprehensive plan on the future land use guide where it is mapped, but think of it as mixed use outside of the downtown area. So all housing types are permitted. There's a good uh, amount of non-residential um, uses permitted as well. Um, ideally, you would have sort of a building you have in the illustration there with um, a couple of stories, two or three stories, where there is um, retail or office use taking place on the first floor, but not necessarily, and more residential type uses on the upper floors. That's a mixed use building, and we will have um, some design standards related to those types of buildings and related to other types of buildings, purely commercial buildings as well, um, in module two in our building design standards that will be forthcoming. So um, a lot of different uses allowed and generally trying to get those buildings built up close to the street in order to help create a more walkable environment. The mixed use building has the um, uh, most um, area of the lot that it can sort of be built on. It um, has um, the smallest lot area so that a person could um, uh, do a building on the smallest lot on a, a, of the set sizes of lots that are allowed on the smallest lot allowable. Um, so it's sort of has easier standards to meet than um, maybe something like a single use apartment or something like that, just basically more generous standards than what some of the other buildings might have. The MUC, as I mentioned, is the downtown area. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the goal is again to have um, uh, mixed use buildings and, and you know, there is room for single use buildings, single use commercial buildings. Apartments are allowed, you know, it says they're all housing types allowed, um, and along with, you know, a lot of non-residential uses allowed as well. And this will have um, design standards in Module 2 also. So something to think about and maybe put in the Q&A if you think of something um, is what can the zoning ordinance do to make downtown a better place? Uh, put that in the Q&A, please, rather than, than the chat. I didn't intend to have the chat option in there. Um, can, you know, are there certain uses you know of just from personal experience that aren't allowed downtown now that should be allowed in, um, in this draft? We can do that. Are there, uh, are the buildings required um, to be too short? Should they be even taller than what's permitted in this draft, which is 120 feet? What other things can you think of? Are there incentives for um, 
for uh, you know doing good development in downtown that we could consider as we keep working on this document. Auto Urban Commercial is the next district. Um, recognizing that some areas aren't going to be mixed use and are going to be auto and commercially oriented. Um, this district spells out um, the parameters on which buildings can be built in this district. Um, and again, there will be design standards related to just kind of purely commercial buildings um, in the next module. There's also an allowance for residential uses, even though the district is called auto urban commercial, um, there are allowances for townhouses and, and apartments. Um, those require a special exception, which means they would have to be um, acted on um, uh, by the, I'm forgetting if it'll be the Board of Adjustment or the Planning Commission, but it will have to be uh, acted on by uh, you know, a, an appointed body like that um, with a public hearing and things of that nature. So there's gonna be the ability to have um, more like kind of horizontal mixing of uses, maybe not necessarily in the same building on top of each other, but allowing residential and commercial uses to be built in close proximity and more of a maybe an integrated type of development so that you can live um, and shop and work in closer proximity um, uh, than, than, than maybe what would be allowed now. General Industrial is the final base district. Um, it is what it sounds like, allowing those uses that are industrially um, related, um, really uh, no, mat, no minimum lot area or width, and um, just some uh, sort of fundamental um, lot uh, related standards uh, to me. We could have design standards related to industrial. Um, of course, they would be a lot lighter than what we would have for commercial type uses, but that is something that could be on the table later. Here's the use table. It's pretty important. Um, the use table is broken down into use categories and specific uses. Um, there on the left, um, any land use that you would hover over um, is going to be defined, or most of them, I should say, at least at this point. If you hover over it when you're looking at it in, in ENCODE Plus, if you hover over it, the definition of that term would show up here, like for duplex, there's the definition by hovering over it. Um, there are uh, P's, L's, and S's in this uh, table. A P means that that use is permitted by right in that zoning district. So a nursery or greenhouse is permitted by right in general industrial. L means that it's permitted. There's no hearing required by any special, um, you know, appointed uh, body. But there are standards that go along with that. And so here's an example of beekeeping, or in other words, an apiary. That's allowed um, with, by, uh, by right, subject to limitations in several different zoning districts. And if you want to see what those standards are when you're using the, um, the ENCODE Plus um, document viewer, you click the link that's on the right in the standards column, and then you'll, you'll get taken to um, the standards that apply in those districts where the L's show up. When there is an S in any of the columns, that's a special exception, which again, as I mentioned, has to be approved by at a, special, at a public hearing. Um, we have tried not to micromanage uses. We've grouped them into categories, and many times it will just say, um, it doesn't show on here, but for offices, for example, we handle offices on just one or two lines of uses saying uh, banks are treated one way and then any other kind of office is treated this way. Banks are kind of called out because they would have more traffic than what you might expect from a normal office with people coming and going. But um, so trying to just treat similar uses all together makes things a lot easier administratively and allows, again, these mixing of uses in um, the zoning district allows that a little easier. We have um, wireless uh, telecommunication facility standards that are fairly much uh, a carryover of what the city already does for those kinds of uses for basically cell phone towers and things of that nature. Accessory uses and structures are in there, regulations for them, where they can go. Think of a detached garage or a shed or, um, you know, at a gas station, a detached um, car wash, automated car wash, things like that, that um, uh, fences are also um, addressed in this section. So accessory uses. <clears throat> Here's a question for 
townhouses, just trying to gauge opinions on this. Um, what should the limit of uh, townhouse groupings be? The current regulations, I believe, are eight. So think of the townhouses you've seen um, in town. Are they, do they seem bulky, like they're big groupings and they're kind of overpowering in size and could be smaller? Do they seem about right? Do you think they should be allowed to be, have even more units on them? Um, if you look at the image on the screen, that's about four units, it looks like. Um, so that gives you kind of a small, a vision of a small grouping of townhouses. So less than eight units together before they have to break apart. Eight is just right. More than eight should be allowed. You don't know or you don't understand or you're neutral about it and don't care too much. So I am going to start the next poll. You can go ahead and vote. Okay, we're approaching 30 seconds, so a couple more seconds. Okay, I'm going to end the polling, and I'm going to share the results. So a little more than half um, thought that eight or more units is appropriate. So that gives us guidance on looking at that standard and um, uh, potentially upping it to, to more than that. Um, and then um, uh, let's see, what was that number? 14 of you, or in the percentage terms, 41-some uh, percent um, thought it should be either that eight was right or should be less. And then two didn't have it. So I'm going to stop sharing the results. Go on to the next one. So how we treat mobile and manufactured homes is um, part of what staff and myself have been looking at uh, in the draft, mobile homes, true mobile homes, which have a definition of being made prior to 1976 and have some other characteristics like, like that, are prohibited citywide, regardless of the zoning district in the draft, um, as are manufactured home parks. So what you typically think of as a one single lot where there are manufactured homes there. Um, the draft does allow single fam or basically manufactured homes to be treated very similarly to single family detached housing, um, especially provided they meet certain standards with related to um, skirting at the bottom uh, of the of the structure, um, having roof pitch, sort of what you see on the upper um, image on this um, slide. So the question based on that information is, should the city permit manufactured homes uh, similarly to a single family home on their own lots? And so there's a variety of options. I'll go ahead and start the poll while I read off the options here. So the options are, um, as you can see, no. Uh, manufactured homes should just not be permitted in the city. Um, keep them only in manufactured home parks. Uh, permit them on individual lots that have those special design standards apply. And then permit them without any special design standards. Just permit them um, as you would a single family detached home. And then, of course, you don't know or don't understand. And um, the neutral option. Got about 75% have voted. Let it go a few more seconds. Okay, I'm going to end the polling and share the results. And uh, almost 60% of you thought that the option of permitting them with design standards was the most appropriate of the options. And then second place was just to permit them um, without those design standards. 
I am going to close um, the or stop sharing the results. Keep going. We're we're in the home stretch, I would say. We have standards for temporary uses. Those are can range from things like food trucks to um, construction trailers on a project where there's a construction office, you know, there on site. Um, uh, what else? Mobile or um, I already said uh, food trucks or mobile food units, circuses, things you see in the table there. There are different. That table spells out um, how long they can be, how many days they can be on a single property, and how many times a year they can be on that property, and then whether there is a, a temporary use permit that is required or not. <clears throat> There's also specific standards for each of these temporary uses. So something to consider. And you might need to look at the document before you can answer this, but what are some um, temporary uses you want to be sure be are addressed, whether you think they're problematic or you think that um, that you want to do something like that and want to be sure there are some, some rules to live by in, in the new document. The final major part of this module shows how different um, items, different things are measured um, with uh, a description on the left and then illustrations on the right. Um, there's different things in here like setback averaging, where um, if you have a empty property surrounded by houses, then the, the setback for the new house that's being infilled can be an average of that front setback. There are allowances for height encroachments, where if you say no building can be taller than 75 feet, but there's some kind of decorative element like a aspire at a house of worship or something of that nature, there's allowances for certain things to exceed that height without having needing to have any kind of special permission to do that. Same goes for setback. Typical examples for that would be something like things that add interest to the wall of a building, like a, a bay window or a chimney or something like that. There's often allowances that those can encroach a little bit into uh, a setback um, just because they often make the building generally look a little better just by adding that extra interest to the wall there. So um, wrapping up, this is the website where you can um, access the, this module. Um, Ashley eventually is going to paste in a um, link to get to that website. And there's probably other ways to um, get to that link, maybe in emails from the city or if you go to the city website itself. You should be able to um, uh, click on that and go to this um, document. So what I'm going to do is show you how to make comments um, in, in real time here. So um, basically, I'm, uh, I'll show you how to navigate and search for different items and um, show some other stuff. And then, then we're going to do the question and answer part. So let me um, stop my sharing for a moment. and. Um, Navigate over to that website. Okay, you should be able to see the website now. Um, I'm going to look at chat real quick and make sure that that is true. Ashley, can you just verify that it's visible? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, here's the website. Go to View, and you will get. Um, you'll probably land on the table of contents. I was looking at this earlier, so it kind of knows where I was at. You'll land on a table of contents that is all clickable here in this manner, and there's also a file tree uh, type of setup over here where you can navigate around. So if you go to, um, well, you can see the whole document by clicking chapter one, and that'll bring everything. Uh, and you can just scroll down and look at the whole thing, the whole module one, that is. But if you want to go to a specific piece, like let's say you want to see more about um, the residential district, you can um, navigate around by opening the file folder here and go into residential district development standards, you'll see that section come up and only that section. 
And if you want to comment on something, you can go over here to the comment box and click that and you'll give your name and your email. And you'll um, give your comment. And if you click submit, uh, both Tan and I will get that comment uh, emailed to us. We'll get notified that you commented and we'll get the actual comment itself. And we will be able to um, take that under, under consideration. We will also um, provide uh, a response to the comment uh, to you. And so um, that's how you do it. Um, probably, hopefully pretty simple. Um, I'm going to get back to the PowerPoint and wrap it up. Uh, just a second. Okay, should be back on the um, on the uh, uh, PowerPoint slide. Yes, it is, Brian. Okay, thanks. Just making sure. Oh, that was the last slide. No, that can't be the last slide. Sorry, let me let me get straight here. That odd. Hold on a moment. Oh, it was hidden. Sorry, let me unhide it and there. Okay, so what's coming up in this um, project? Uh, obviously our open house today, um, this recording will be um, available on the city's website within the next few days, recording of this meeting. Um, we uh, will have a public comment period on this module, which you can participate in and enter your comments for, uh, and it ends July 5th uh right before midnight this meeting will also uh, is also being broadcast on um or is it no i guess it's not being broadcast our next our ordinance advisory committee on july 2nd at one is going to be a virtual meeting and it is um, going to be streamed uh, uh on the city's um, website and broadcast on channel three local channel three um, a recording of that meeting as well will be posted on the city's uh, website a few days afterwards. So if you are watching this and you have a question and you wanted to comment uh, or ask a question, uh, you can email um, Tan Dang with the city. Her email is shown on the screen, T-H-A-N-H dot D-A-N-G at Harrisonburg V-A dot gov. And um, that question or comment will get to you and we will um, respond to it. So that wraps up my um, talk on this, and I appreciate everyone uh, sitting through this. And we're going to now do some question and answers and um, allow, um, if you have a verbal question you want to ask, you can raise your hand and we will um, call on you and I'll try to unmute you and all that kind of stuff. So. I see one. Um, let me try to let me do the the hand that's raised with Dave, and then go over to the Q and A and try to do uh, a few of those as well. So, um, if city staff would like to um, turn their cameras on and unmute themselves, um, I'm gonna see. for Dave. I'll put allow to talk. And Dave, you should we should be able to hear you now. Um, thanks, Brian. This is just a quick question. Um, thanks for the hard work you guys have done. It looks like many uh, you've taken to heart many of concerns of Harrisonburg residents. Um, I have just a simple question. <laughs> uh, one of the things you mentioned early on was clarifying solar arrays, and I was just wondering if you could expand on what you mean by that. Sure. So um, we have rules in the um, in the draft, and those are in 
the uh, accessory uh, uses piece, um, which is 10-1-24, if you can wanted to jot that down. Um, there are provisions related to solar panels um, where uh, by right, you can have roof mounted um, or ground mounted panels if they meet certain standards um, related to kind of scale and, and size and, and that type of thing. And there's even an allowance that if um, you can't meet those standards and still want to do a solar panel, then you can go for a special exception with the public hearing and all that kind of thing and um, and take and get it done that way. If you can't meet like the, the size area uh, or the um, square footage requirements for the, the panels or any other standard related to, to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to go and look at some of the Q&As um, here. So um, I'm going to have to uh, kind of read some of these a little uh, and get, a, get my head into them and then provide an answer. So um, Joe asks, will the maximum number of unrelated occupants allowed to share a home be covered in this update? module one or another in the future. Um, so I, I'll answer the part of that that I, uh, that I can. That is going, that is in module one. It is um, tied to each of the residential uses. If we, if you go to the use table um, that is in the zoning, uh, in the draft zoning ordinance, go to the use table. And as I showed in the demonstration, click on the standard uh, the standard column for like um, single family detached as one of the land uses. Click on the standards. It'll take you to the occupancy um, requirements that are in the draft. And I believe those occupancy requirements are very similar to what the city currently uh, has and enforces. Um, and I'm stand willingly for correction if I'm wrong, but I believe that is uh, where that stands right now. That's correct. As, as far as for um, what we typically describe as unrelated individuals, but we've expanded and clarified the occupancy and, you know, what a family means. And um, uh, I think group housing is included in that, that occupancy also. Yeah. Okay, let me find um, uh, uh, another question. So um, Joy, one of Joy's questions is Article A uh, purposes does not expressly list energy efficiency, reduced carbon footprint, reduced operational costs, or greater resilience. Hopefully um, these are included in the proposed ordinance changes. So that is um, a good point. Um, we've worked in communities before where we've worked in sustainability bonuses that would um, give additional density or additional building height or additional other things like that, that builders or developers or business people often like if they work in certain, um, <clears throat> certain characteristics, maybe those that are advocated for by Energy Star or LEED um, or other organizations like that. So we can, we have um, in other places built in uh, you know, a sort of a menu of characteristics. And if you do one of them, you get one type of one bonus that you can pick from. If you do two or two to four, you get two bonuses that you can pick from, from a list related to like density or um, building height or some of those other characteristics. So um, we can definitely build that into the standards and even more so build those into the purpose statement. So that's a good point. And then Joy had another question. Um, to uh, what extent, if at all, the zoning districts and or standard um, revisions address the sometimes disconnect between JMU and city objectives? Um, one way that we'll, uh, we'll work on that, and I don't think we have all the answers yet for, for that, is um, reviving and including as an overlay district, the 01 overlay. Um, <clears throat> 
I can't speak to its current content very closely at this point. Um, I know that often um, what we've heard from our stakeholder meeting was that, um, that the impacts of student housing and one small step to try to address that, I think, is the allowance of multifamily over in the um, auto, or, uh, auto urban commercial zoning district. Um, allowing that to take place there um, has benefits related to, you know, uh, having the students live closer to amenities and also um, maybe uh, just automatically creating a bit more of a distance between those um, housing types of student housing and um, the um, less dense, more, um, you know, ownership oriented uh, types of housing that you would see maybe in the um, low to medium residential zoning district. Um, other Q and A's. Uh, you mentioned that the final draft won't have the former zoning ordinance districts in the chart to compare to new districts. It seems that this would be helpful, a helpful tool to leave in. I guess that's up in the air to an extent. Um, that's referring to the uh, zoning district establishment table where um, there is on the far right, a column showing the zoning districts of the current ordinance and how they relate to the new districts. Um, really, I think when the map is uh, uh, put out for public review, that will help a lot. Um, and I, I, I don't think it's 100% decided that that column would go away on the district's table. Um, but one thing, one reason to maybe not have it um, is just the, uh, the potential for, for confusion. It's going to stay in there for sure as this um, draft is out in the public um, and we're going to, we'll have to arrive at a decision uh, on what to do with it in the end when it comes time for adoption. Um, a similar question, someone, uh, Barry asked, where can I find the proposed zoning map? It's not for public review yet. It's still being uh, uh, deliberated upon very heavily. Um, and I don't think we have a, a time certain, but stay tuned to these, uh, um, these open houses and um, we will put, present it um, at one of these. And there's, there's two more left. Brian, could I chime in for a moment? Um, yes. I would I'd like to encourage that, uh, you know, for people to look back at the PowerPoint presentation at the slide that you had with the table that described where we were envisioning where the districts might be located, but that this is also the opportunity through public comment that people can write to us and tell us where they think the boundaries could be expanded for if they were thinking of downtown, for example, being the MU, MUC district, or tell us what properties, if they have specific properties in mind, we'd like that feedback too as we work on the zoning districts and the zoning map. Yep. Um, there was a, a comment in the chat um, about um, when parking will be discussed. That will be in module two. A uh, question from Barry, why does the MUC have a seven to 10 foot side setback when that does not exist now? So MUC is downtown um, and there is a seven foot side setback for um, certain uh, building types. If they're one and two story and then 10 feet, 10 foot setback, if they are three or more stories um so that's going to apply to the more residential and mixed use buildings um, where there are non-residential buildings um, with non-residential uses in them then there would be the probably the more uh, what you're more accustomed to the zero foot setback if we need to consider reconsider that we obviously can as i said everything is a draft um but that um that is in there uh, and applying to more, again, of the residential buildings as opposed to non-residential. Can I, would you mind if I add a little bit more to that, Brian? Go ahead. So um, that, that's a great question. So as, as many know, the B1 district in downtown has zero, so, you know, zero setbacks. 
Um, Brian described what is being proposed for the residential uses where people would be living and sleeping. And the, the setbacks that are established or proposed in the, or, in the draft ordinance is to address fire protection and life safety, the spread of fire um, between buildings, as well as uh, the need for ladder access to second and third story windows. Um, I would like to call attention to, because it may not be obvious, because I think we need to work on clarifying it, in fact, in the ordinance, is that um, we've also included the ability for a property owner or somebody who's building a new building to request a special exception or a special use permit approval from city council that would allow the building to be constructed up to the zero setback. Um, if the, the building was constructed with either one of two options, fire sprinklers or um, with, uh, with the walls on that side that have no openings and that are a minimum one hour fire rated. So there is still the opportunity to get zero um, side yard setback and, and rear yard too, in fact. But uh, the minimum would be that 10, seven and 10 feet, depending on the number of stories, if you weren't going to do those things to enhance uh, the, the safety of that building. Thanks. Um, Kathy has a question. Uh, what you, you mentioned downtown, what do you mean by downtown? How far north, east, south, or west in general? Um, I don't know if that one slide had um, a description that would be helpful. Um, and I could sh reshare the screen for that, um, which is the, the table that showed general location, potential locations. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share that particular uh, slide. So this is, again, to answer the question of what do we mean by downtown, you'll get a detailed answer when the zoning map is um, available. But for MUC uh, on the top row, um, it says the current B1 district um, plus um, some ex uh, possible expansions to include areas depicted on the mix uh, as mixed use in the comp plans land use guide. So um, this isn't very um, highly high resolution, but <clears throat> the white area with um, pink and green hash mark shows um, mixed use uh, recommendations on the uh, land use guide and the comprehensive plan. Um, of course, downtown doesn't cover all of this area. You know, when you get in out in the farther out areas from downtown, that would become more of a um, mixed use neighborhood zoning district as opposed to. Um, downtown MUC zoning. Um, I couldn't speak to what the um, uh, exact uh, street boundaries or even general street boundaries are, and I don't even know if um, city staff could at this point because of the, um, you know, the scrutiny that the, the draft map is currently going under. I can just throw in sort of uh, the definition of what downtown is, is sort of an age old question, I think, depending upon who you might ask and what the context is. Uh, but for the purpose of our of our uh, study here, when you're thinking about downtown, it's really um, kind of just broadly speaking, I would say maybe approximately the inter from a northern section, approximately the intersection of Washington Street, then to the south, going all the way down to MLK. Um, and then you can even think from a westerly direction over to Route 42, uh, so Virginia, uh, South High, North High, and then maybe on the east side looking at uh, approximately like Broad Street. Um, so just, and, and those aren't hard, fast rules. Probably if Ton or Wesley would answer this question, they might even be given something slightly different, but just sort of the general approximation of uh, where we're thinking to, for, to center that focus question. Um, Wesley just um, pasted in uh, in the chat a, a higher a link to a higher resolution land use guide um, that you could look at as well. Remember, that's um, a recommendation as far as where how 
future areas could be zoned in the future as opposed to being a true zoning map. <clears throat> and I will say with the, the Q and A's that we're getting, um, anything we don't end up answering, I'll make a note of before this um, meeting is, uh, before I end this meeting and stop recording and, um, and get a response to you if I can't verbally respond now um, yeah, at the moment. Um, let me find another one. Um, Laura mentions temporary dining. Uh, let's see. Might be connected to a different comment. Um, where does it, uh, Jay asks, where does it discuss the parking requirements? Again, that will be in the next module. Uh, many ab current abandoned properties are stranded since they do not meet current parking requirements. That's a good observation. And we can build in allowances that um, if parking is just physically uh, impossible, um, but a youth wants to be in a building, then we can give breaks that um, would um, allow that use to take place there with a reduced amount of parking. Um, if it's, you know, if, if basically if they'd have to demolish the building in order to provide more parking, then that's kind of not, uh, doesn't make too much sense. So we would um, provide a break in that uh, area um, in order to try to fix um, that situation from happening too much. Um, there are a question if we've, uh, from Joe, if we have reached out to mobile home park residents um, to answer questions like the one in your poll. We have not um, and should for sure. Um, especially uh, if there's a single kind of point of contact. I don't know if there is, um, but uh, uh, might be able to pick their brain on what, uh, what they would like to see uh, happen uh, for that and that topic in the city. Uh, trying to go for, for more questions. Uh, as opposed to comments. Um, Dan asks, how do communities address the potential drop in property values and make appropriate just adjustments to assess values when broad zoning district changes are put in place that increase residential dis density? Uh, and then in other words, within existing residential areas. Um, Obviously, that bleeds over a little bit into some things that none of us on this meeting can control uh, as far as um, property values and assessments and things of that nature. Um, often, uh, I think demographically speaking, um, certain, uh, certain demographics of people uh, appreciate the higher density that can come along with some of the uh, things we're talking about um, can appreciate the mixed use opportunities that also can come along with it. Um, and so uh, property values might not necessarily uh, drop as a result of that. Um, uh, that's not a, I'm not trying to make a very broad statement that, that they, that, you know, that it just wouldn't happen. But um, I think there is evidence that, um, that certain people like to have a live in a more uh, dense and mixed use environment um, as opposed to um, something more suburban that other people can can appreciate and enjoy, and enjoy. So I don't know if I have an answer to that of what other places have done to deal with that. It's just that um, I do know that that certain groups do appreciate the types of opportunities we hope to create in this project. Um, several parking questions that um, basically are going to get answered uh, in the next module, and really they're mainly asking when are they going to get addressed. Um, let's see. Uh, having to... Oh, and I, I hate to put you on the spot here, but I'm, I'm wondering if you you might speak a little bit more to the occupancy and some of the things that have been talked about, because there are probably folks looking at some of the occupancy rules showing that 
um, the that it's up to three individuals per unit uh, rather than in some locations four. And some of the discussions we've had about overlay districts for university residential occupancy. Do you just want to keep going? <laughs> I mean, uh, well, I'm, I was going by what I remembered reading um, about. We haven't yet fleshed out all of the specifics of, of all of the occupancies. Of course, if we did not provide an opportunity for there to be, say, four unrelated individuals, there would be a lot of nonconformities across the city, something that needs to be decided upon, but that there's been discussion among uh, and proposals put forth about doing, I think it's something like what maybe Charlottesville, one of you might be able to correct me, has done with their occupancy regulations. Yeah, so a number of college towns kind of use occupancy regulations as kind of a proxy for um, uh, university students. Um, they typically live in larger groups of unrelated people than uh, people who have you know, graduated college or um, are not in college. Um, and so I guess the idea is basically, there's an entire industry, it's called purpose-built student housing. Um, a lot of the apartment complexes that we see around the city with the four bedrooms, four baths, um, kind of fall into that category. Um, it's a you know, multi-billion dollar industry, billions of dollars of construction every year. Um, so I guess the idea is using occupancy, um, splitting our occupancy up in two. So one, we would allow up to four unrelated individuals and that would be kind of our, um, obviously anyone could live there, but the idea would be that that would be uh, where the purpose-built student housing would be concentrated. Um, and then everywhere else, we would allow up to three unrelated individuals um, to try and differentiate and uh, kind of drive student housing into some parts of the city and um, make other parts of the city less attractive for student housing. Okay. There is a couple of questions about homestays and short-term rentals. Um, uh, basically, Randy says, will this process be addressing the short-term rental question that gets asked very often? Will there be areas of or zoning districts that would allow broader use by right for short-term rentals, B&Bs, and boutique hotels? Um, I think the hotel, the true hotel question um, could be a separate thing. In the current draft, though, um, short-term rentals, which are grouped as um, using, I guess, the current, you know, the current terminology, short-term rental or homestay, those are, um, uh, those require in the draft a special exception in every district except for general industrial, and in general industrial, they aren't allowed. And then there are standards that go along with that um, special exception requirement. Um, and they are probably, I think they're fairly similar to what the city already has. So the short answer is there is not a district where they are just um, permitted by right or permitted with limitations uh, in this draft. Um, similar structure to what is currently uh, going on now. So there are uh, about 13 comments and, and or questions left. Ashley has um, captured those, she said. Um, so um, I will take the time to address those and forward to Tan and uh, who will then uh, forward on to, um, uh, to you all, to the asker of the question or the provider of the comment. Um, I want to thank everyone, unless uh, city staff, do you all have anything else to say before we close down? Thank you very much for um, attending. This will get posted again. If you need to watch it again, please feel free to comment on our draft and we'll keep working toward the next module and see you uh, again soon to talk about module two. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye-bye.